Hi there. I'm Angelo John Howdy. Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network. And um, in case you want to know more about us, you can just simply go to our website, sacredinclusion.com. I'm here with my uh, friend and colleague, Sharif Abdullah, who is about to do um, an exploration for us um, about the change and about exploring holonic consciousness. And we're going to get into that. Um, Sharif is going to tell us what he means by that. But I think I should take a moment and tell you a little bit about this man's background. If you're from the Northeast, you might have known about Sharif way back in the day. Um, as he writes on his website, his quest for the world for a world for all began in the worst that America has to offer, Camden, New Jersey. His early life was a study in toxic relationships, including welfare, public housing, violence, and pollution. His activist and empowerment background stretches back to the mid-60s when he helped found the Black People's Unity Movement an organization dedicated to self-help and development in inner city Camden. As a teenager, he participated in the creation of a sewing factory, two daycare centers, over a hundred units of affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sharif received a BA in psychology from Clark University in Massachusetts, and went on to earn a Jur Juris Doctor degree from Boston University. He's practiced law with indigent people, successful businessmen, et cetera. And despite all these successes, Sharif became increasingly disillusioned with the adversarial process of a means of social change. And after six years, he retired from law practice, choosing a new path to social change that is positive, inclusive, spiritual, and honors the dignity of all beings. Sharif, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm not hearing you that well. Maybe I can I can bump up. No, it's my volume. It's my volume. So, you know, Sharif, um, in your early days, you were very involved in what I call conventional social activism. Um, very, very deep into it. And then something changed. And as you put it on your website, um, your focus shifted. You get you became disillusion with the, the, the sort of adversarial process of a means of social change. I wonder if you could maybe tell a story that for you um, illustrates its limitations and maybe tell us why you decided to change your focus. Yeah, uh, one of the, the issues in terms of um, the traditional social change situation in general and the specific part of being a lawyer trying to make change is that we make the, we start from the process of everything is okay. Everything's okay, except for these people right here. <laughs> and then we're going to fix these people and uh, then everything will be okay for everyone. And it took a while to figure out that that was simply not the case. Um, <clears throat> I remember one time I came, I, 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 uh, had a really difficult uh, uh, criminal case. Um, and uh, the, the it was in the news. So, so the six o'clock news was carrying the fact that this guy who should have gone to jail did not go to jail. Um, and um, my, I'm watching the, the news program with my daughter, and she says, uh, what do you do? What, you know, like, like She's like seven years old or something like that at the time. Says, what, like, what do you do? And the answer that lawyers are taught is that um, I zealously represent my clients for the sake of the, 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 the purity of the judicial system. Um, and the real answer was, and the answer I gave her was, I get scumbags out of jail. <laughs> and I, as, I, as the words came out of my mouth, it's like, this is not what God put me on earth to do. Uh, so um, from that time, I guess it was about another year or so, um, I, I gave up my practice. Um, there has to be something better in the world than this. Now, what a lot of people do is they hold their nose and they keep practicing um, because 
all of the bells and whistles of the breaker system are yours. You get the big money, you get the big house, you get the prestige or hatred of your of of your your community, um, and the world has to consist of more than that, more than than getting stuff. And so I've been on a quest to to uh, figure out what it is. How do we actually get paid? How what is the what is the payment that's in your heart, not the you know the fat that goes into your wallet? Now I imagine a lot of people that are listening to this um, have not read your books, and um, and I know you you have a lot of vocabulary which we're not going to go into. But the one vocabulary thing I do want you to go into, you talk about holonic holonic consciousness. Sounds a little bit but, but, but like colonic, but I'm sure that's not your intent. But in any event, could you define every time I every time I say that when I'm trying to dictate something, it comes out colonic. So I've, <laughs> I gotta go. I have, to, I have to spell check my spell checker. You know, um, now yeah, you don't want that this is that may not be a bad idea. You know, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, no, this holonic is very different. So anyway, would you define what what holonic consciousness is and? Um, how it's different from ordinary consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the word holon is a word that was uh, uh, created by uh, Arthur Kessler, who was um, working back in the 1950s and is looking at how we are all um, whole to ourselves. Like I'm, I'm here, you're there, but each of us is made up of other holes. So, uh, I'm sitting here, but I am made up of a heart and lungs and arms and a head, et cetera. And that head is made up of other things. It's got eyes and nose and mouth and other things. And those eyes are made up of other things. So you can kind of keep going down and down and down into um, uh, more and more holes, smaller and smaller holes. Similarly, we can go in this other direction so that um, you and I make up a community of males. You and I make up a community of African American males. You and I, in a weird way, we, we can keep going for uh, <laughs> African American males from the Delaware Valley. Okay. Um, and so at a given point in time, we we become part of the earth, we become part of the solar system, etc. And so I have my individualized consciousness, the one that's making my mouth move right now. Um, for most of us, and for almost uh, the, the overwhelming number of us on this planet, it's the only kind of consciousness we have. It's the only kind of consciousness that's possible. We don't want to think about anything else. But my sh my... My knowing and my research is showing that there's a whole other level of consciousness, um, a level of consciousness that is operating from the whole, not from this individualized, separated corner that has had these experiences, while your consciousness has had completely different experiences, also some the same. And so our our challenge is the individualized consciousness has gotten us into the mess that we're in right now. What we need to do is start looking at how does the consciousness of the whole, the holonic consciousness, um, get us out of this position. Um, we all have had experience and I should, most of us have had experience in the holonic consciousness and not known about it. If you're ever in a really, really good basketball game, I mean, like where you're physically in the crowd, there's 20,000 people all around you, all of you screaming for your team. It's a really close game. And at that point, you lose your awareness of your individual self. And if your team wins, you wind up hugging the person that's next to you and you don't even know this guy, you know, and you're yelling, you're screaming, you're pounding each other on the backs. And that is an experience of holonic consciousness. 
if I can give you one other one, which is uh, pretty amazing. I, I used to live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm in uh, Portland, Oregon right now. And uh, the, the Mint Museum used to show these old movies on its lawn during the summertime. So you, you pack a picnic basket and you sit on the lawn and you, you watch these old movies. And uh, these had a cartoon first. And so they, they did the cartoon. And the screen went dark while they were changing the reel to the old movie. Yeah, this is back in the days when they had reels. <laughs> and so um, the screen went dark. And right when that happened, this huge meteor streaked across the sky. And 3,000 people all at the same time went, ooh. And then words went silent because that note sounded spontaneously by 3,000 people in harmony. I mean, we, we, it, it, it's, it gives me chills today, 30 or 40 years later, okay? And so <clears throat> that, and, and I, I've talked to people who were in that group watching the meteor and then watching each other, watching ourselves do something that nobody had planned, nobody had thought up, and an experience of a reaction to beauty. No one had given us instructions. If you see a meteor, two seconds after the meteor sounds, we'll, we'll, we'll sound a note, and then the altos will do something, you know, like it, it was, it, it just happened from us. It was an experience of beauty. It was an experience that no one asked for, no one could predict, but it was um, profound. Uh, profound even, like I said, so many decades later, I, I can still hear it. It's still, still with me. So what would happen if instead of running a society from money, instead of running a society because you're afraid of something, because instead of running a society because you're greedy for something, what if we ran that society in service to the whole? What if we ran a society in for the good of all? Um, I don't know what would happen, but I would certainly like to find out. Um, what else do we have to do? Well, you know, um, well, I mean, that, that's sort of my next question, but let me ask it in, in this way, because uh, I know that you have uh, an experiment that you're um, contemplating, you're embarking on, actually, um, in doing something about exploring what this thing is, what this mm -hmm. collective hol holonic conference might look like. Um, mm -hmm. You've done some research um, in terms of look at, look at the, for example, the behavior of ants. You talked about this, this particular experience that you've had. Um, what do you know about, or what do you intuit um, what might that be like? And mm -hmm. following from that, um, what's your experiment like? How are we going to get there? Or um, how might we get there? That's a better question. Yeah, number one, this experiment is a real experiment. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. Um, um, I, I hope there'll be a sign, no people were broken in this experiment. Um, the... Um, <clears throat> We don't have time what to get into. Let, let's talk about of, what your research, research your research has yeah. uh, has has told you about what this might be like. Right. Um, yeah, we just don't have time for the the um, uh, the the tons, really tons of research that have been done, uh, short term, like a comet going overhead, and then long term studies that have taken place over the course of 10, 20 years around um, how this holonic consciousness seems to unlock um, latent abilities, latent powers that human beings have. Um, uh, I just mentioned very quickly um, the uh, there's a guy that wrote a book, uh, Rupert Sheldrake. Uh, sure. That's the name of the book is something like "Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home," 
And people who have dogs say that their dog always knows that they're when they're coming home. The dog is always sitting on the front step, on, uh, sitting at the front door. Um, and people say, oh, the dog just you know knows I come home every day, night at six o'clock. At six o'clock, he goes to the door. Um, or the dog knows the sound of the car. When the car pulls in the driveway, the dog goes to the door. Well, Sheldrake doesn't accept things like that. He wants to, as a real scientist, he wants to test it. So he puts a, dog, a camera on the dog on the sofa, and he puts a camera at the front door where the dog would be waiting. And, you know, the dog is, you know, uh, smoking cigars, playing cards, doing all the things that dogs do when you're not there, okay? <laughs> so um, when you come home, dog goes to the door. So to test whether or not it's at a particular time, he got a bunch of people over in, in England and said, you know, we want you to con con do this experiment and we want you to go home at times when we tell you to go home. So the person will would pick up a telephone, the experimenter will pick up the phone, call the owner up and say, right now, we want you to intend to go home and then go home. So the person puts the phone down and 10 miles away at his house, the dog gets off the sofa and walks to the front door. So the, uh, the, the next thing is the dog is habituated to the sound of your car. So the, they call the person up and they say, we don't want you to go home right now. We want to, you to do something for us. We want you to drive around town according to our instructions. So the, the experimenter gets in the car, says, turn right here, turn left there. So he's leading him all around town and leads him right past his own front door. Dog does not move off the sofa, drives a mile away and says, now we want you to intend to go home and then go home. Dog gets off the sofa and goes to the front door. So these and other experiments are showing that, you know, we, we may have the things that make us comfortable in terms of how the world works. And then there's how the world works. And that to me is this vast uh, um, playground of consciousness that very, very few people um, uh, explore. And uh, Sheldrick has come up under heaps and heaps of ridicule for this. No one questions his scientific method no one's saying oh you're falsifying data or anything like that they're just saying oh this isn't something that you should be researching it's everybody knows why your dog is no you're, you're saying that you're trying to prove dog telepathy and he says i'm not proving anything other than there's something else going on now can we test something else can we do um experiments with each other, with small groups of people, with large groups of people that show what that some that there's something else going on and what that something else can do. Um, and <clears throat> uh, if I can just give you one more example, this is the longitudinal study. There's a bunch the, the there was a, um, a convent somewhere, I think maybe in Michigan, but I don't remember right now. Um, and the and most convents are getting old. The 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 nuns in the convent um, uh, they're turning into into rest homes, but they're still convents. They're still doing their prayers. They're still doing all their activities, etc. And all these nuns agreed. All of them agreed that uh, they would undergo all this this periodic testing. And when their um, uh, when they died, they agreed that their brains would be autopsied and they would be they would do uh, research into their brains. So uh, they lived their lives and um, and they were, they, were, they were number one, they're living to a pretty old age and number they they were also living uh, a high quality life. They were they were not a whole bunch of dementia or anything like that. They were living, really high um uh high quality lives and but when they opened up their brains they found that they were all they all had serious uh alzheimer's um they should not have been functioning at that level 
Now, all of these researchers are now going, sifting through the record, trying to, to see why Sister Anne, who had, you know, major brain issues, did not display any major uh, brain issues right up to the time of her death. Now, from my point, point of view, it's there is a Holonic consciousness that's attached to that, that uh, uh, convent, that they're basically using each other's brains, okay? Um, but because there is no consciousness theory that allows that to happen, they they are um uh they, they they're looking at the the zinc level in in slide so and so in this person's brain trying to figure out why someone with alzheimers is high functioning so i'm i am not an academic i don't care whether or not i you know anything i'm doing uh is is published and peer reviewed, etc. I want to. I, I talk about functional consciousness. If we can get people to spend more time with each other and learn how to build this this holonic consciousness, the individuals can be a lot happier. More important than that, if we can build the connections between all these individuals into an entire society, and even more than that, build the connections between human beings and all other beings, we can start doing some things that, that I think can be downright exciting and can can actually help us with this this uh, planet with the, that, we, that we think that we can continue to trash. Well, um... When we get together um, on the, um, I believe it's the 18th, the third Saturday of, of the month, um, you're going to tell us, I'm sure, a lot more about this and maybe even let us in on, um, maybe invite us to participate in this experiment you have going on. But if you could just briefly explain um, the importance of this. You know, we've been going mm -hmm. along for how, however many thousand years and, uh, you know, you could make a case that we're doing okay. You could make a case that we're not doing okay. But what, in your view, is the importance uh, of us uh, tapping into this, um, what you're calling holonic consciousness. Um, who was it that wrote the book? Um, this is the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, I think that we're it's, right it's, there. I think it's I think a line that, of Shakespeare, but I'm not sure. No, I think it was Dickens. Um, Dickens, yeah. Tale of Two Cities. Yeah. Um, so... Um, I, I guess my I, I, I pulled that from somebody else because <laughs> so um, depending on your point of view, you no, know, we're fine. We're in the twenty first century. All of us got these new, got these toys, and and we're talking about landing on the, on Mars and having a colony on the moon, and we're doing okay. Now, there's a guy right out my window right now who's in the middle of having a psychotic episode. I mean, I'm, I, I could turn the camera around and show him to you. Um, he uh, is, is a broken person and is broken from society. And we have absolutely no answer for that. Um. James Hillman wrote a book, um, a, a prominent psychologist, wrote a book and said, we've had a hundred uh, years of psychotherapy and we're still not well. That was the title to the book. Now, all, the only thing that, that most of us do is say, oh, let's just pour some more money on that or make that person go away somewhere. And then we can keep talking about Mars and et cetera. But all of us are doing uh, not well. We need a radical way to get to another world. How many climate conferences are we going to have before we recognize that we are destroying our own niche? We're destroying our own um, connection with ourselves, our connection with each other, and our connection to the planet. I think that we have to start looking for some other ways of doing things. 
And we have to start looking for some ways that we can, out of our hearts, not because we're making money from it or not because somebody's making me do it, but we can all be of service. Mm -hmm. I think about uh, back in, uh, I think it was 89, when the uh, the big San Francisco earthquake, uh, the 880 expressway, which was a double-decker expressway, pancaked down on itself during rush hour, trapping thousands of people. And the people who uh, live near that were, were climbing. Well, while this structure is still shaking, they climbed up in the, in, in, in the uh, wreckage and were rescuing people uh, in the wreckage. You you look at I mean recently over in Turkey, uh, people risking their lives for the sake not of the other but the sake of the whole. They became part of the whole. Now we do that as soon as we let go of our um, uh, individualized consciousness when we become unself conscious during a basketball game when a meteor going, is going overhead. Um, I want to see if it's possible for us to do that on purpose, to let go of that stuff that keeps us stuck in this way of thinking and open the doors to, um, to a kind of community that we don't practice anymore. Um, and we don't practice anymore to our detriment. And so that's the 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 gist of it. Um, how do you do that um, when it's not taught anywhere? How do you um, reinforce that? And the most important thing that I'm looking at: how do we keep that going over time? So it's not just like this flash in the pan, but it becomes something that all of us can um, practice. Um, regularly uh that's that's the, the the challenge so um we just have a few minutes left sharif um we have your we have your exploration coming up on um march 18th at um nine or eight o'clock your time 11 o'clock eastern standard time um very briefly what might people expect to participate to participate in it i'm going to be asking people to um I'll, I'll I'll be talking a, a bit about kind of the foundational stuff that 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 uh, we just talked about a bit, but um, we're going to be asking people to step out of their self conscious um, place. Um, in a we we are we're we're asked to do that a lot so so we all have these ex these many experiences of holonic consciousness in our sports teams in our church or our mosque or our synagogue in our um we we have these glimpses of it i'm trying to tr i'm my goal is to get that glimpse to cross all of humanity um um, nobody's going to be signed up for the the religion of Sharif. <laughs> I want if I try if I tried to pull that off, I wonder how fast this, you would you would yank my cord, you know. Um, but the um, uh, can we have an experience of? Um, I don't want to give too much away here. Of seeing something, doing something seeing each other and doing that um, in a way that is outside of uh, the potentials for um, outside of space and time. Um, um, we know that in, in times of emotional stress, people can, um, I knew my mother was about to call me uh, five minutes before she called. Okay, how'd you know that? Um, uh, the 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 number of people who say that oh, when so and so and a loved one died, they could feel it. 
although they didn't even know what they were feeling for an hour or a day or a month back in the days when you we didn't have instant communications. So I'm gonna we're gonna play with that a little bit. Um, we won't have a lot of time to do that. I'll be um, uh, doing this a couple more times this month uh, in in uh, March, on the 22nd and again on the 26th. And I've got some some uh, information coming out about that. Um, and the people who show up on the 18th, I will invite them to show up again on the 22nd and show up again on the 26th. Once you kind of know what you're what you're feeling, uh, or feeling for, I should say, um, yeah, you can you you, you may be able to um, uh, uh, to build up an experience or to have a greater experience. And uh, as I said, yeah, who knows? We're we're making this up as we go along, but isn't that what life is all about? Um, the uh, I I uh, I was watching a documentary on uh, electricity, and they were talking about how Faraday had done something that no one else had done. Took a coil, stuck it into mercury, put a needle on top of it, and the needle starts going round and round and round. And the now from our point of view, it's like, oh yeah, so what? He created an electromagnetic coil and he turned it on. So what? You know. From his point of view, this is the first time a human being had ever seen anything like that, at least in these times. And he's trying to figure out, what does this mean? And that's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out, what do these things mean? And how can it mean something that will be good for me as a human being, me as one of eight billion human beings, and me as one of trillions and trillions of living beings on this planet. Um, when we get to that point, things are going to get really interesting. Um, until we get to that point, um, we're going to keep, ha again, keep having these climate conferences, keep having these um UN meetings that are supposed to make us all peaceful and happy, and we've never been peaceful and happy. Um, we can't figure out why we're why we're not happy. Um, uh, it's it, it will really be um, a challenge, and and I kind of feel like what else do we have to do? We we should be up for this challenge. Well, um, it's tremendously exciting. Let, let me just tell tell the people a little bit about it. We're calling it catalyzing the change. An invitation to participate in holistic, hol holonic consciousness. It's holistic also. Um, we invite you to attend. I'm going to put the link um, up and um, we'll, um, I'm just looking forward to it. So yeah. Um, yeah, bring your brother, bring your son, bring your mother-in-law. It'll be, it'll be great. What, what did, what did Donald Trump say? It's going to be wild. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to use well, that. Well, hopefully in a, in a, a hopefully, a different wild, hopefully a productive wild, hopefully a wild that will bring us together and will bring us together in such a way that we don't want to let go. I mean, that's that's the challenge. Um, it sounds wait, one, one more quick story. Oh, right, good. Um, there, there was um, this rally in a park in, I think it was right here in, in Portland. Um, there were some um, right wing um uh, demonstrators and that of course detracted the left wing demonstrators and so there was a right wing veterans group and then a left wing veterans group and the guy on the, the microphone the, ah, and, and then all the the left winger ah. and one of the the right wingers said i don't know what you people want i don't know what you're all about and and okay I get, I'm going to give you three minutes to get up here and say whatever it is that you're about. And he said this to it's a white guy. And he said this to this uh, black uh, veteran. And the guy got up and he only talked for two minutes. 
And in two minutes, they're all shaking hands and clapping each other on the on the back. And and yeah, you know, like like I don't agree with some of these, I'm sorry, but I agree with what you said. Yes, we're all Americans. We're all that. And he did this in two minutes. Now, what happens when you, instead of walking in, knowing I'm separate from you? What happens when we all walk in saying, I'm connected to you? And I am you. We'll see. Yes, we will, Sharif. So I'll see you on the 18th. I'll probably talk to you before then, my brother. Thank you so much. Sounds very cool. Thank you.